Hey, welcome to your second Rust video on this channel. I'm really excited for this one. We're going to get into some intermediate topics of Rust. This will build on the principles taught in the first lesson, so definitely check out that video if you want like an hour long introduction to Rust. We're going to talk about some of the approaches to object oriented programming like concepts in Rust. For example, traits, because Rust has a unique approach to doing things. It's not like the other languages where you will have a base class and a derived class. Instead, you build everything using traits. And a trait will basically be an agreement saying, hey, this struct I created is going to work a certain way and implement a certain set of functions. It's kind of like interfaces. If you come from another programming language, then that word probably sounds a little bit more familiar to you. But if you don't have prior programming experience in other languages, that's totally fine. You can definitely go along with this video. A few quick notes. Timestamps, that's going to allow you to jump to any section that you need throughout this video because there's going to be a lot of information in this one. Second thing, this is going to cover a variety of topics and really just help you strengthen your intermediate Rust skills. And then the third thing is I just wanted to mention two resources. The first is an introduction to software development as a career. This is a free intro course that's part of a much larger course you might be interested in, which can cover the fundamentals of software development and a specialization such as front end, back end, or DevOps. I will leave a link to get the free course down in the description below. I highly recommend it to get you started and motivated and to help you understand the framework in which to approach software development. And then the final thing is a lot of the videos I upload here on YouTube, I also upload them to my website that you can download them and watch them ad free. And you can do that completely for free. So I'll leave a link down to that below as well. And with all of that out of the way, I think we're finally ready to get started. Hopefully you're still with me. Let's learn about some of the unique things of Rust and I'm, I'm excited. Hopefully you are as well. We're going to start off with a discussion on the Rust standard library. And this is described as battle tested shared abstractions. Now, an abstraction is just a fancy word to say hiding the inner details. Basically, there is a collection of things that we can use that are already available to us that makes building in Rust so much easier. And you've probably used this even if you didn't realize you were using the Rust standard library. This gives us some of the core types like VEC and Option, as well as operators, macros, input and output, multi-threading, and many more things in this list. This page gives you a fantastic 1000 foot view of Rust and the main things you're going to be working with. So I wanted to start with this page so you have a better idea of where things fit in and the context around them. So let's minimize this and we'll have these different sections. You can see them over here on the left as well. And I actually want to start at the bottom. So let's jump to the keywords. So we're going to work our way from the bottom up in this list. Now I'm not going to go through and tell you every single one of these, just the main categories so you can understand what you are working with. And the very first thing you want to know about is keywords. Keywords are words that are reserved so that you typically can't use these for variable names. For example, you can't create a variable called if. Some other languages may allow you to replace or shadow over the keywords. However, Rust does not allow you to do that. So if you want to become more familiar with Rust, you could just go through this list of keywords and learn what each one of them does. And then, you know, once you understand each one of these, I'd say you have a pretty good understanding of the different capabilities in Rust. So this is kind of like a framework to understand what percentage of the language you have learned. Now I want to go in a little bit more detail on these keywords. There is a page in the Rust reference and it's talking about the different categories of keywords. There's strict, reserved, and then weak. And I specifically wanted to talk about weak here because these are keywords, but they only have special meaning in certain contexts. And it's possible to declare a variable or method with the name that is one of these weak keywords. And there's only a few keywords that are weak and you can see that list of them down here. So this would be the keyword. Now, when you give a variable a name, that name is called its identifier. So you can use the weak keywords as identifiers, except within certain contexts. And this basically will allow Rust to add new keywords in combination with some syntax. And this will basically allow Rust to add new keywords without breaking code in earlier Rust programs, which may have used these keywords in their code. So for example, just to try to make that a little bit more concrete, say you created a variable union before union was a thing, and then you update to a new Rust version, well then your code should still work because you're not using union the way union would be used. So this is only a keyword when used in a union declaration. So if you're not defining a union, then it works still. I don't wanna talk about keywords for too long, I just kinda of wanna give you an overview. The other thing is reserved keywords, these don't do anything currently, but they're reserved for future use. So you still can't use them for identifiers. 
And then the reserved words are strict. These you cannot use in any context. Next section up in our list is macros. And these, we've seen a few of them. For example, we used print line and we also used fec. These are used almost like functions, but behind the scenes, they are implemented a little bit differently. When you open one of these, you'll see this crazy syntax and this macro rules. I don't really understand all this, but it's basically a pattern to describe how to match the macro inputs. So if you want to learn more about how these macros work, you could learn how to read this syntax. Sometimes they look like function calls, other times a little bit different. For example, this one you pass in square brackets and then comma separated values. Next up, we have the section on modules. A module will be used to group various things that are related. So for example, it could group functions, macros, and different types but those are all related to one individual concept. So for example, we can go into one of these such as FMT for formatting. This is a good example that has a lot of different things in it. So you can see the different sections. So this organizes some structs, enums, traits, functions, type aliases, and macros all together within the same module. And it's basically just a bunch of utilities for printing and formatting strings. So some of these you've seen I'm sure if you followed the previous video, for example, we used string pretty regularly. However, you didn't have to import this. Sometimes when you're using values within these modules, you will need to import them with use and other times you won't. So how do you know if you need to import them or not? Well, a really easy way is basically if your editor complains, hey, we don't know what this is, then you can probably click suggestions and click import. But more technically, there is a set of things that's automatically imported for you, and that is called the prelude. So here is some documentation on the prelude. And basically, this makes developing a lot easier because these are some of the most commonly used things. And if we had to say use for each one of these, it would get pretty annoying and verbose. So these ones are automatically made available to us, including some stuff from string. So standard string, this is the string struct, and the trait to string. So you can use strings by default and you don't have to say use at the beginning of your code. Now back to the list of modules. Another one that you should probably be familiar with is collections. This is going to introduce a bunch of useful collections to your code that will allow you to store data in different ways, grouped into sequences, maps, sets, and miscellaneous. So it could be good practice to implement a linked list in Rust but that is already implemented with the linked list structure. It's also nice that you can hover over this and see what it is. So you hover over this and it says struct from standard collections linked list. So use that to your advantage as you go through and hover over all these different links. You can figure out what they are without necessarily having to click through and reading about them. Now you may have noticed that in this list there wasn't anything about an array, but we know that's a collection available to us. So where does that come from? Well, an array is actually known as a primitive, which is a little bit different than a struct. So a struct is a custom type that uses primitive types. So think of primitives as the building blocks for all other types used in Rust. So these are really special because you can basically build anything you want. They are the Lego pieces. So it's important to be familiar with most of them. And you can find that in this standard library page as well. So here are the primitive types. Now, most of these are pretty intuitive and just variations of one another. For example, integers, we have I8 all the way through I128, and then unsigned variations U8 through U128. But then there are a few other things, for example, I size and U size. In the previous video I mentioned, that was another numeric type you could look into. We have char for characters, bool for booleans, pointer for raw unsafe pointers, reference for references, Slice for a dynamically sized view into a contiguous sequence. Stir for a string slice. And then up at the top we have array, which we just mentioned, and then never, which is experimental. So you can read more about that if you're interested, but we're mainly just going to work with these main key types, including array. We're gonna talk about that some as well. So you'll see, for example, string slices, which is a common way to create strings as a reference to a string slice, but you won't see the capital S string here. And that's because it is a struct. So if we go back down to our modules and then we find string, we can see examples of how to use the string struct. But it's worth noting that this is not a primitive type. So behind the scenes, it's going to use primitives to build this structure. So if we look at some Rust code and we hover over string, right click, go to definition, you will see that we have a struct string that consists of a vec property 
which is a vector of u8. So a string is really just a vector of u8 type, which basically means a sequence of 8-bit values. Now this does support Unicode characters, but one of those could be represented with multiple u8s. So in a way, if you have a good understanding of the primitive types, then you'll have a much easier time learning some of the new types and creating your own types. And you can go into VEC and see that these will use primitive types as well, such as U size here, and then raw VEC, also U size. And this one obviously goes very deep and it's using generics, but ultimately having a solid understanding of each one of these is going to be very helpful, as well as some of the main modules. So that's some of the basics. We have a pretty good overview of what we are learning within Rust now. Basically just going through that list and learning some of the most important things. So now that we have the foundation out of the way, I want to focus on collections and structs. So a collection will allow you to store multiple values and a struct will basically group values together. So both of these can be used to store multiple things, but generally think of a collection as a tool to store multiple values and a struct as a way to group things together. You're creating a new structure and defining different fields. So that's what we're going to cover in this one, but we're going to start with collections. We'll start with the primitives and then we'll learn some of the other types such as vectors as well. Now we're not going to cover all of the collections. As we've shown, there are quite a number of collections inside of the collections module. So you can go through each one of those and learn how they work. We're just gonna cover some of the essentials in this video. This video is really described to help train you to learn these things, but you should be able to then take the information from this video and use it to learn new things on your own. So let's get started with some examples. To get started, we will say cargo new, and we're going to go through some examples working up to building a little game. And this game is going to show a lot of different principles of Rust, so we'll just say cargo new game. Now game is just the name of it. If you have a better name for your game, then feel free to use that. And then we'll open this in an editor. And then from here, I'll open a new terminal, and this is where I'll use the terminal from now on. And we will start by opening main.rs, and we'll see a print line hello world. Now I'm going to add everything to a repo. It should initialize a repo for you automatically. So you can just say git add dot initial commit. I don't know why I am screaming and that is our commit message. And then I'll create a new repo in GitHub. We'll call it rust game. If you want to get this code, create a repository. And then I will copy these lines here and push up my code to that repo. So now you should be able to go to github.com slash Caleb Curry slash rust dash game and that should get you the code from this video so let's start with some of the basics and then we'll start building out these game principles so we will start with defining an enum and an enum will give you a set of different options to choose from so for this game we're going to be collecting gems so we could define what gems are possible to find and it would look something like this so inside a main we'll say enum and then a name to describe what all these different values are such as gem, and it's typically singular, as this is describing what a gem could be, and it's not describing a collection of gems. So we will define the different possible values for a gem. So diamond, comma, sapphire, ruby, topaz, onyx, and jade. Now where you use this enum will decide where you define this enum. So if you're only going to use it within main, you can just define it inside of main. But if you want this to be available to other functions, then you could take the enum and move it outside of main, and we can still use it inside. So how do we use this? We'll create an example gem variable. We'll say let gem lowercase g, and this will come from gem capital G, colon colon and then you can choose one of these different options so we'll say we found an onyx and then if you hover over gem you will see that the type is gem now some people get annoyed with me with my conventions here but i do this on purpose lowercase for the variable uppercase for the type so it shouldn't be confusing that they have the same name in fact it should be clearer because you can immediately see that this is describing a type and this is describing a variable or an instance of that type. So we could create multiple gems. We could say gem one, I'll copy paste and say gem two, and this one will be jade. So this is how you would use the enum. And it helps you have stronger safety because you know you're going to choose one of the valid values. If you don't, it's not going to compile. So if we went in here and just misspelled it, 
it's going to complain no variant or associated item named Jade. This is a lot safer than if we just had a string saying Jade, which some people would do, because you could have a typo in here and it's not going to know that it's a typo. Or you could just put a value that doesn't make sense, you know, you could just say pizza. There's nothing scoping it to a set of values, so that is the value an enum brings. Now we have a pretty good understanding of the basics of enums. They basically allow us to create our own custom types for very basic uses, choosing one of the possible options. The next thing I wanted to talk about is a tuple. A tuple will allow us to easily group multiple values together. So let's say we have one of these gems, but not only do we have the gem, it also has an associated value. We could do that by surrounding it in parentheses, putting a comma, and then adding another value in here. For example, an onyx might be worth $25. Honestly, I have no idea. Probably more than that. And then let's go through another example, getting rid of this gem two and replacing it with an actual gem. So this time we'll say gem and jade. And we'll say this one's worth $10. Now it could be the case that different gems have different values. So for example, jade, you might find a better one that's worth 15. That's totally fine. However, you probably don't want to name that the same thing. So now we have gem one, two, and three. It's also possible to put more values in here if you wish. So for example, you might have found 10 of them. I don't really know what this third value could be, but just showing it as an example. It's basically just a very easy way to group things together without having to create a bunch of variables such as gem one type and gem one value and gem one count. And then you basically have the same repeating variables with slight variations and it just gets really sloppy. So tuples can come in really handy when you need very basic groupings. So we have some experience now with creating an enum, creating instances of that enum type, and we've also worked with tuples. Tuples don't really define a structure or a type, so you can just put whatever you want in here. You don't have to follow some blueprint that was described earlier. So you can hover over these, and for example, gem2 is of type gem, comma, f64. And then if you hover over gem3, you'll see that it's gem, f64, i32. So these are of two different types, gem two and gem three. Gem one and two, these both share the same type. And this is important when you go to learn about arrays because when you define an array, everything in the array has to be of the same type. So let's see an example of this. We will go after gem three and say, let gems, and again, naming convention, lowercase, so it's a variable, plural, so it's a collection, and then square brackets, passing in gem one and gem two. This is how we can create an array containing two gems. If we went in and tried to pass in gem three, this would give us a compiling error. Now it says it expects a float. So I was thinking, you know, that's pretty general. Maybe one of these could be F32 and the other F64. I wonder what would happen. So if we say F32, we can basically be specific and say that our literal is an F32 instead of an F64 with the underscore F32. And then we could remove gem three because that's clearly a problem. This is interesting because if you hover over gem one now, you'll see that this is an F32. So when I remove the F32 and hover over gem one, it's an F64. So there's some kind of compiler magic going on here because we don't have the explicit types being used. It's intelligent enough to see like, hey, this is an F32. We're gonna put those both in an array. So we need to make sure these are both F32. And if we comment this out, we can see that it's an F64. So that's some kind of compiler magic that I don't really know the full details of, but it is clear that you do have to have exactly the same type. So if we explicitly say that this is an F64, this is now not going to work. Expected tuple F64, found tuple F32. So cool, we have a basic idea of how to work with this, but enough to work around, I want to actually go in here and create a bunch of gems, and we can do this in line. So we can use parentheses here, so you could say gem onyx, and then we'll say it's $25, or whatever currency you guys want to imagine. Gem diamond, and we'll say this is $100. We'll say we found another onyx, and this one is worth $50. And then let's say one more. Gem ruby, and this one was $10 worth. Cool, so here is our array of gems, and if you hover over gems, you'll see the type, and it looks like this. So we have a semicolon inside of these square brackets, and then on the left, you're gonna have the type, and on the right, you're going to have the size. 
The size is how many elements, and the type in this case is a tuple with a gem and an F64. Now the important thing to understand with arrays is that they are static, meaning you define the size and type up front. This means they're not really ideal for something that you don't know the size of up front. And another thing is you need to define the values for the array up front as well, or choose to use the default. A default is very clear for a number such as zero or an empty string for strings, but for some custom types, it doesn't really make sense like the default gem. So if I was to keep track of the gems that I've found, I probably wouldn't use an array of gems. You definitely could do it. You would basically just implement the default trait for gems and then initialize your array with a bunch of defaults and then update those as you go. But then you would need to keep track of which ones were authentic and which ones were just the default values and the size might be more than you actually need or, or not enough. So it's kind of like hacking around the obvious solution, which would be to use a vector, which is dynamic. You could just add in gems as you find them. That's probably what we'll talk about here in a few, but there's a few more things I wanted to cover with arrays. So if that didn't really make a lot of sense because we haven't really talked about traits or defaults or anything like that yet, then don't worry about it too much. The main thing you need to know is that when you have something that's dynamic, you probably don't want to use an array. There's still a few things that I want to show you with an array, and there are scenarios when an array is useful, so you should be pretty comfortable with them. Let's first talk about how we can loop through them. The easiest is with a for in loop. So we'll say for in, and then you'll create a variable, and it'll go for item, or you can think more specifically and say gem in gems, and then what you wanna do with each gem in the curly braces. So for example, we could print line and say, this gem is worth the curly braces. And then what we want to provide to that value, how do we access the value amount? You use the tuple name, which is going to be assigned to this gem variable, dot, and then you'll have a zero or one. So it's indexed kind of like an array, but instead you'll use a dot, so we'll say dot one. So zero would grab this, one would grab this. And then when we run through this, what we should see is four iterations printing the value of the gems. So the first iteration, gem will be assigned this, and then we'll grab 25. The next iteration, gem will be assigned this, and we'll grab 100, and so forth. Now, unfortunately, it's not quite as easy to print the title of the gem. So if you go hover over this now, you'll see gem doesn't implement standard format display. So real quickly, we're going to show an example of how you can implement a trait. Now, as a reminder, a trait will basically say that some type implements some feature or capability. So the enum implements the capability of being printed. If it implements that trait, then the user of the enum, in this case us, we can just trust that the enum can be displayed. We don't have to worry too much about creating some custom function or anything. Once that trait is implemented, we can just put it inside of a print line like so. Now, I'll warn you now that the syntax for this is going to be a little bit more complex. There's a few new keywords and concepts you might need to wrap your mind around to fully understand. In the meantime, you can create this implementation Trust that it works, and then as you learn more, it'll make more sense. So we'll start by saying IMPL, and this will be defined outside of the enum, outside of main, and this is going to create an implementation block, and then we can add traits to certain types. So we'll say format display, that's the trait that we want to implement, and then for what type? The type is going to be gem, and then curly braces, and then we'll basically make a match for these different options here. But we need to do one additional thing because when you implement a trait, it could have you implement multiple different things. So you need to be a little bit more specific and say what you are implementing. In this case, we're going to create a function called format. And if you're ever unsure of this, you can go to the ROS documentation and you can search display, which is the trait we're trying to create. You'll see the option for trait here. So we'll click that and it has one required method we are required to create. And then this is the method signature. It's going to have a reference to self, which will be the instance of that enum. And then an F, which is going to be a mutable reference to a formatter, which can be used to format this in strings. And then it's going to return a result. So we'll start by creating this general structure. It will return format result, and then we'll open the curly braces. 
Now let's define the parameters here. The first one was a reference to self. Self is how we generally refer to an instance of this enum. You'll see what that looks like in just a moment, but for now let's finish defining the function parameters. We will have a second parameter we'll call f, and this is going to be a mutable reference to a format formatter, which we're not getting suggestions because we haven't imported it yet. So it's just formatter. And then for this, we will say use at the top. So use standard FMT. And that should get rid of the unknowns for the FMT here and here. This one's complaining about a type mismatch but this will be fixed when we finish the implementation. All we have to do in here is use the write macro, and this will take the formatter and then some output. So we'll just say test, and then this is going to be returned. So get rid of that semicolon, and that'll get rid of that error. So once we have that return, that will be met. But we don't just want to output test. We'll basically want to match the instance against all these different values to decide what we want to write as the output. In the meantime, though, I just want to show you one thing, and that is now we can say gem.0. It doesn't complain about it, so we should be able to run this and just see the output test. Kind of silly, not very useful, but it shows that the implementation is being used. So now we're getting the gem is worth test, and what we could do is actually format this a little better. This gem is worth amount, so gem.0, and then gem.1. So let's try this now. We say run. This test is worth. So it seems to be working. Now we just have to go in here and build this implementation to be a little bit more useful. We'll just match what the value actually is against these different enum possibilities and then have a different output for each one. It's kind of obnoxious, but it should be pretty much done after this. So we'll replace this right with a call to match. And the instance is going to be referred to as self. And then all we need to do is match against the different gem types. So gem colon colon, and we'll say diamond. And for each one of these, we will return a different call to write. So this one, we will pass an F and then the name diamond. And you can decide how you want this output. You have complete control. So you could say diamond with a lowercase d here, comma, and then we'll say gem colon colon Jade, and I'm just going to keep this in the same order. So Sapphire, right, F comma, Sapphire, and then we'll just do this for each type. So the next one will be Ruby, and this will write Ruby, and then Topaz, we'll write Topaz, and then Onyx should be Onyx, and then lastly, Jade should be Jade. That should be everything. Looks right to me. Hopefully I didn't mess up any. We'll say run, and now we get the output we would expect. So looking against this list, we have an Onyx Diamond, Onyx Ruby. That's the output we get and their associated value. I wanna take a brief moment to talk about derivable traits. This is going to make your life a lot easier in many scenarios. This is basically where you can say, hey, I'll take the default implementation for a trait and then I don't have to worry about creating my own implementation. Now we just did the display trait and there is not a default implementation for this. There is however a very similar one called debug, which is invoked when we use a colon question mark for the formatting inside of a print line. What do I mean exactly? Well, if I put a colon question mark, this is the debug format and is often used for quick developer output. And this output can be implemented with derivable traits. And you can see from this appendix, some of the different derivable traits, one of them being debug, which you can indicate by adding colon question mark within curly brace placeholders. This is so you and other programmers using your type can inspect an instance at a particular point in a program's execution. Now, in some scenarios, that format's going to be adequate. And in others, you are going to need to have the custom format, which we just did. So I figured I'd start with the hard one showing how to implement format. So then going to the derivable type is a lot easier. So what we'll do is we will put colon question mark for this set of curly braces because that's going to refer to the actual gem type. And the format is already implemented for floating point numbers. So we don't need to do anything for this curly brace here. And now you'll see an error pop up. Gem doesn't implement debug. The trait debug is not implemented for gem. Add pound derive debug to gem or manually implement debug for gem. So we'll copy this here where you just type it out and then you can put this above 
your new type, your enum that you defined. So we'll go up here and we will paste it right here. So now Gem has two implementations, one for the display and one for debug. So now with the debug format, we can just automatically print the enum value. However, you have zero customization over this. So when we run, you'll see that it prints the names exactly as they are with uppercase characters for the first letter. So if you wanted to change that, you couldn't easily do that. You can make it lowercase just jumping through a few hoops. So you can say dot to string and then dot to lowercase. This will convert to a string and then convert all the characters to their lowercase equivalent, which will change that first character. So let's run this and we can see, oh, now it's in quotes. We don't really like that either. So you can see we're just kind of jumping through some hoops. So you could trim out these quotes that were added or you could change these to lowercase, but that's not really recommended either. So you can see if you really want anything custom, then you should just implement it yourself. And then you'd have to go change all of these. But just to show you this, I will complete this task. This is going to complain because it's not recommended syntax for Rust, but technically now I could remove that to string and run and get that output the way I desired. But now that you already understand how to implement format, it's kind of going out of your way, making it more difficult. So I'm just gonna put all that back. I'm not sure if showing you that was distracting or helpful, but the main thing you need to understand here, the takeaway after all my rambling, is that use the debug format for debug purposes. So if you need to see what the values are, but maybe not if you need to display that to the end user in your console-based game. In that case, you should probably implement format, and if you implement format, you could probably just use that for debug purposes, unless that's more custom and you just need the raw output from debug. In that case, use the debug format. Implementing the format trait allows us to customize this however we want. So if you need to change these values or modify anything, you can do that all with format. So I'm going to put this all back to how it was using the uppercase characters for the enum type. And then I'll put this back to having just gem.0 and empty curly braces. And I'm going to commit the basics, so if you want to compare what you have to what I have, feel free to check up on GitHub, and I'll push those changes. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of different things. What are we actually going to use arrays for? If we're not going to use it to store the gems we've found, what would we use it for? Well, I'm going to use it to have a basic map on where to find these gems, so you can basically think of it as coordinate system with different X and Y values. So let's talk a little bit about 2D arrays and then we can use that to place gems around the map and then the user has to find them. So let's create a 2D array. We will call this map. And you can imagine at each position in this map, we have something. So we could make it to where that actual position contains an enum, but that gets a little bit complicated because then we have to basically make the data optional with option. Don't really want to deal with that. So instead what we will do is we will just create this to be a 2D array of Booleans with false or true. And if it's true, that means there is a gem at that location. So you can create an array of default values by saying what you want that value to be and then the size after a semicolon. So this will create an array of size five, all filled with false. So we could check this with print line and passing in just uh, curly braces and map with the debug format. And you can see that value here. So five falses in an array. Now what we wanna do is if we wanted to make a five by five grid, we will basically do five of these and it'll look something like this. So same idea, the size and then the default value for each row is going to be this. So now when we run this, it's just going to list a bunch of falses, but you can see these are separated every five. Then what we could do is determine where we want the gems to be. You could generate this randomly or just to keep it simple for now, I'm just going to hard code these. So let's talk about how we could set a gem to exist at a certain spot. We'll say map, and then we'll pass an index for the row and then the column. So let's say row index four, column two. And remember these start at zero. So this is index four and index two. But they start at zero, so this is really like the fifth and the third. And then you can just set this to true. To do this, you will need to let map be mutable. So we'll say let mutable map. And we will print line after so we can see that change. So you can see in row index four, this final row in column index two, it is set to true. So let's just do this for five gems. So I'll copy and paste this a few times and change some of these values. You can pick whatever you wish. Just make sure it's within the bounds. 
All right, there we go. So that should be our, our new map. So we'll run this and you can see this is what it looks like. To make this a little bit easier to see, I'm going to print this with for loops. So for row in map print line, passing in row with the debugs uh, format. So now I'll comment that out. And when we run this now, it should just be a little bit easier to read what it might look like. And you can visualize this kind of as a map where each one of these is a spot the person could go. And it's actually quite painful to look at like that. So I'm actually going to change this to a number. Probably should have thought through this earlier, but I don't think it's that big of a deal. We're going to default this to zero, and then we'll set each one of these to one. And I'm hoping this will format it a little nicer. So we run it now, and that's a much better visual. So you can now see immediately where those gems are. Now the question is, if this says that there's a gem at that spot, how can we specify what gem is there? Well, you could actually associate numbers with different enum values. So for example, diamond could be one, sapphire two, and it'll actually automatically increment from this. So we could just leave the one there and the rest should have two, three, four, five, and six. And then from here, we could change what gems are on the map by using different numbers here. So let's just put a little bit of everything so one, two, three, four, and five. I'm sorry, Jade, you're not gonna make it this time around, but maybe next time we can put you in the game. So you can imagine now when we run, the different numbers represent the different gems. So now we're going to use a vector for us to be able to add gems to our gem bag. This is basically going to work by taking an index, grabbing the number at that index, using that to check what gem that would be, and then pushing that into a vector. A vector is just a dynamic array, so we don't need to establish all the data in the vector up front. So let's first create a vector. So we'll say let found be vec colon colon new. And we'll just start with an empty vector. The type of this is going to be vec and it's generic, so we will provide a type here in the angle brackets. Now earlier on we showed a tuple where we had a gem and a price associated together. I'm going to simplify this and just make a certain gem be a certain value. So we're not going to have different values for the same gem type. In that situation, I could put just the gem type here and then I could just calculate the value later. So the type for this is just going to be gem. That's just going to make it a lot simpler to do this by making a distinct item having a specific price every time. So the way you would add a gem to this would be by saying found dot push and creating a new gem instance such as gem diamond and then whenever you want to change this we'll need to label it as mutable so mut and that's how you would add an element to the vector and then we could just print this as we've printed arrays before passing in found with the debug format for this to work anything inside the vector also needs to implement debug so i will just make sure we have this derive for our enum which we talked about earlier, but I ended up removing it in favor for display, but it seems like we're going to need it now anyways. So we will keep this for debug purposes. So now we should be able to run and just see that we have a vector with one value diamond. So that's how we add to the vector and print it, but how do we actually grab an index, check what the actual enum value should be, and then push that into the vector instead of just hard coding diamond here. Well, we will build up to that. Let's grab a spot on the map, say index one and four, and we'll say let data be map index one, index four. But we can't just say found push and pass in data. We need to convert from a number to an instance of this enum. Well, we can create a custom function that will do this behavior for us, and we will make that as part of the implementation of our enum almost as if we were overriding a trait. So it might look something like this when we're done. We could say gem dot from number, passing in a number data, and then we could basically use that number passed in to check against the different enum values and convert it to that correct instance of the enum. If that sounds confusing, it's because it is. Basically what we'll do is we'll go up here and we will have a new implementation block, but this time it will be for gem itself instead of something for gem. So we're not going to create a trait, we're going to create a function, specifically an associated function with this enum type. 
So what do we want to add in here? We'll create a function from number. This will be the number passed in, whatever numeric type, but this is going to be a really small number, so I'll just say U8. And then inside of here, we will do a match, checking against this number. And this part will feel a little bit redundant, but basically we'll have to make the same kind of number association from a number to an enum type. So one is going to be gem diamond, and then we'll just go through this list here. So two will be gem sapphire, three will be gem ruby, four will be gem topaz, five will be gem onyx, and six will be gem jade. And then we need to specify that this function will return a gem. And now the way you invoke this is by saying gem colon colon from number. This should work for what we have, but it's probably not going to work for all cases because the user could pass whatever they wanted in as a number. So we need to have a default case. And for this, we're basically going to wrap everything in an option, which is how we could say that it could give us a value or it could give us none. So in the default case, I'm going to return none. And then I'll say this returns an option of type gem. And then for each of these, we will wrap it in sum, saying it does have a value. Or an alternative way of doing this would be to just choose a default gem. And then for any other number, you could just make that default gem be returned. Now this is going to change the way it's used. So let's go back to the calling code. From number is going to return an option. So we could match, checking to see if it returns sum or none or you could say expect, which could panic. However, this is the easiest way to do this right now. Invalid number, cargo run, and we see the value onyx. So it works the way we expected. Let's just confirm that by checking the number. So the number is five, let's scroll up to the top, and we see five should give us onyx. This process of associating enum types to integers and being able to convert between them is kind of a pain. And because of this, there is a crate that will automate a lot of this process for us. So I'm gonna show you how you can install that and use that instead of our from number function. But I just wanted to show you how to implement it manually. I'm going to show you the easy way, which is to install this crate. So we'll say cargo add num derive and num traits. This will add it to your cargo file. And this will give us a new derive option, which is called from primitive. And this will bring in scope num derive from primitive. However, we also want to bring in a variation, which is num underscore traits. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow us to, in our calling code at the bottom here, instead of use our from number function, we can use from U8, and this is going to be automatically provided to us, meaning we can completely remove this custom from number. So I'll just delete this whole implementation for gem. And this from U8 is still available to us. So we say cargo run, and we get the same exact output. That just saved us a ton of time, but now you understand both ways of how this is going to work whether you do it manually or through this crate. So we have some of the key components to build this game, but how do we now get user input and check that position on a map? You could also create this so the user could move around, you know, pressing W, A, S, or D. Seems a little bit more complicated, so I'm just going to have the user type in a coordinate. We'll check if that's a gem, and if it is, add it to their bag. Some of this code could come in handy just for reference, so I will comment that out for now. The found vector, we'll just keep it here defined at the beginning, and we will ask the user for some information. Search in X, Y position. Example input, five, three. Then we'll create a variable to store their input. That will come from string new. And then IO, standard in, we've seen this in the previous Rust video. And then dot read line, I will import IO. So hover over that, quick fix, import IO from standard IO. Now we should be able to have read line available to us and we can see that signature, which takes a mutable string reference. So we'll say, and sign mutable input. And then we'll keep this simple with expect for now, failed to read line. 
Now we can take both x and y from the input at the same time. This will be stored as a vector. So this will be a vector and it will be a string slice reference coming from input dot trim dot split and there should be a split white space here. Splits a string slice by white space and then dot collect. So this should make an element in this vector for each component in the input based on white space splitting up the, the parts. We could check if parts dot len for the length is less than two. We can just print line two numbers required. And I'm actually going to make this equal to two. So they have to put exactly two and that should be not equal to two. So if the parts is not equal to two, then we'll say two numbers required. Now we will create two variables X and Y, which we can retrieve from a match expression checking to see if those are valid values. And if they are, we'll put them in X and Y variables and use that to access those positions in the array. So it'll look like this, let X comma Y, and this is going to come from a match expression, same exact structure. So both of these will be in parentheses. We will get the X coordinate by saying parts index zero. This is still a string, so we can invoke parse, and this will need the type, which we can say is U8 and then the parentheses. Then we'll do pretty much the same thing for y, so I will copy this, paste it, and just change this to index one. And then we can check that both of these values are okay with okay x and okay y. And you can learn more about that by hovering over parse and looking at the example usage, being able to access the value through okay. And if this is the case, then we will return x, y. And then we need to catch all if anything goes wrong. So underscore arrow. And then we will make a body with a print line saying something is wrong with the input. And then we will just return from the function to end the program. Now let's figure out if they found a gem. Using some of this previous code, we can grab whatever's at that position. So say map x and why and then we'll push this into the found gems vector these will both need to be cast to u size and then the expect here could just be no gem found and then let's just print our gems so we'll say data here with the debug format and then remove this second argument here. So if we test this out and we use say one and four, we should get onyx. So cargo run one, four. Okay, we got the number version five. I should actually be printing found here. So that was my bad. Cargo run will then say one and four and we get onyx. Cool, so let's try it now with an invalid position. We'll do a valid position, but something that doesn't find a gem, such as zero, zero. And it says no gem found. And then we'll do it again, just with some wild numbers here, like 2020. Index out of bounds, the len is five, but the index is 50. Okay, cool. So we're getting some crashes when it's really just stuff that we could fix with logic. So we can definitely improve that, but we're on the right track. So we could do a match here. We'll say match and then gem from u8 passing in data and then we will have the different arms the first one being sum with the gem inside which we can just call gem and then the other being none so let's do the sum case we can return the gem so we'll say let gem and then bind this whole match and then if it's none we will print line and say no gem found at that position this does pretty much the same concept as this down here, but is not going to actually panic, which is just a better practice. So if we try zero, zero, it just says no gem found at that position and the program stops. Also another improvement would be right here where I'm saying two numbers required. I forgot to return from the main function to close the program. So this is basically a scenario where if anything goes wrong, we're just ending the program, which could be improved but just kind of working through it. So let's try no input and it says two numbers required. And then let's say something like five and zero. <laughs> something is wrong with the input. All right, so we're getting some feedback. 
You can also use a match here for this expect if you wish. It will look like this. You'll say match, all of this, and then we'll open the curly braces, save, it does a little reformat for us. And then I'll move the actual text of this inside and remove the expect section. So now we can check for okay and anything okay, we will do something. Otherwise, we can check for error and print line, fail to read line. So if it works, we don't have to do anything, but if it errors, we will print line. This allows you to have a little bit more control over what happens if it works or doesn't work, but we're effectively doing the same thing here. So now I wanna build on this and basically do it in a loop so we can continue to ask the user for coordinates until they get all of the gems. So we'll say here while found dot len is less than five, meaning there's still more to find, then we will do all of this stuff all the way down to here. And we can even print found as we go for now, save and it will indent for us. At the end of this, we will say found dot push, passing in the gem that we found. And then we can change the map. So X as U size, and then Y as U size, and set this to zero. So basically remove the gem from the map. And now instead of returning from the main function, we could just continue to the next iteration of the loop. This will allow this to continue going on and try again getting input from the user. So I'm just going to put continue in for each of these. I'm not 100% sure when this one will hit the error section, but I believe it would be still okay to have continue here. And we also need to check the bounds for X and Y. So if X is greater than or equal to five or Y is greater than or equal to five. If this is the case, we will print line and say invalid index. We should probably tell the user what valid index looks like, but we will say continue. And then up in the prompt, we'll say zero to four. So when we run this now, let's try four, two. And we now have diamond. If we say four, two again, no gem found at that position. Now let's try zero, two. And now we have topaz. Let's try one, two, and then one, four. So one, two, one, four, and then three, three. So three, three, and then the loop should end. And then at the end here, we can tell them that they found all of the gems. Congrats. Now I wanna get some practice with a hash map. This is basically a key value association where the key itself is hashed to then find the destination where the value should be stored. And it works the same way when you look up a value, you give a value to look up, it's hashed, and that'll give the destination to find that data you're looking for. There's various ways to do what I'm about to do. For example, we could have just created a new function, an associated function to calculate the different values for gems, but I wanted an opportunity to show this other data structure. So we will create gem values, and this is going to be a hash map new. And the way you add an item to a hash map, which we might have to import this quick fix, import standard collections hash map, and you can see this complaining about the type needing in generics a key and a value type. So the key is what you will look it up by. That will be the gem and the value could be a number such as F64. So to create this type, you'll use a colon hash map and then generics. The key will be the gem and then F64 for the value or some other numeric type. Then to add elements to this, we will say gem values dot insert this will take two arguments, the first one being the key, the second one being the value, which is actually literally going to be the value for the gem. So the key will be gem and then one of these such as diamond, and then comma value, we'll say this is worth a thousand. And this will be F64, so we'll put dot zero zero. This will complain about traits not being implemented, specifically EQ and partial EQ which is required for gem to be implemented in order for it to be used as the key. So if we go up to where we created our enum gem right here, we can include in this derive EQ and partial EQ. And I think we're going to want hash as well. And that is how you insert a value. So we'll just do that for each of the gem types. So gem jade 
I'm not going to worry about order here. I'm just going to put them in somehow. Gem Onyx. And I honestly have no idea what any of these are worth. So these might relatively just make no sense, but just put some numbers in here. Sapphire will be worth 1550 just to show you the use of floats. And then Topaz. $9.99. Now we can just iterate through our found gems, add up all of the values found from the map. So we'll say four gem in found, and we will create a total out here. So let mutable sum start at zero. And then in here we can access the value by saying gem values in square brackets providing the key which in this case will be that individual gem. This should give us the value, which is a floating point number, which we can then add to sum with plus equals. So it looks something like this. This is expecting a reference to a gem. So we will just put an and sign and then we can print line. The total gem value is passing in sum. So cargo run, and then just to make this a little bit easier, I'm going to scroll up to these indexes so I can type them in pretty easy. So four, two, one, two, three, three, zero, two, one, four. You found them all, congrats. The total gem value is $1,425.49. Wow, congratulations guys. That is an amount of money that you should be proud of. Now I want to talk about how we can organize our code a little bit more by creating a function dedicated for the game, and then we can just invoke that function. It's not really gonna change the functionality of our program, but might make it a little bit more organized so we don't just have one ever increasing size main function. So you can imagine this function being defined here, we'll say fn game, and pretty much what we'll do is we'll generate a map, put some gems in it, and then we can play the game here. So this value is going to come from invoking game and we'll just return the found elements. So that's what this is going to return. So we'll go up here and define the return type to be a vec of type gem. Now we'll take all of the code after this call and move it to that game function. The only thing we're going to keep here is after you complete the game and then you can calculate the sums. So we'll go all the way to this point to where it says you found them all, congrats. So I will cut this and I will come into here and paste it. Now this is going to introduce some problems because found is not going to exist in this context. To fix this, at the start of the function, we will just create a new local found and it'll look pretty similar. So mutable found, this will be a vec of type gem and will come from vec new. Then at the end of this function, we can return found. So let's scroll back down to the bottom of our function. I didn't mean to take this, this shouldn't be here. Then at the end, we will say found. That fixes a lot of the problems, but there's still some because map doesn't exist and that's because we created it outside of that function. So we can just pass it as an argument. So down here, when we invoke the game, we can invoke this game multiple times with different maps if we wanted. All I have to do is pass an immutable reference to map. This will then be defined as a parameter when we create this function. So this is going to take map, which will be a mutable reference. And then this will be U8 semicolon five. And we will have five of those. So it looks something like that. Now you could probably make this work with dynamic size. So you don't want hard code the size and the parameter here. That's up to you if you want to try to implement that. So let's test this out. It runs, so that's good. Now let's try typing in these indexes. Four, two, one, two, three, three, zero, two, one, four. And there you go. Now you could definitely continue to improve on this, you know, make the size of the map variable, randomly generate the positions for the gems, create more functions to extract different pieces of this to its own little section perhaps move some of it to its own module in a separate file. There's unlimited things you can do, but this is a good start. There's still a lot to learn in Rust when it comes to defining your own structs and your own modules, and probably like 50 other things, 
But that's all I'm going to cover in this video. I think at this point we've covered so much this is a good checkpoint that we could probably go to the next video and continue discussing structs and how to create methods and all of these other things you need to know about. What I did was I added this code to the repo and pushed it to this URL so you should be able to get the latest and continue to build on these principles. One way to get started with this would be to create a struct which keeps track of the game map, the found gems, and any other game attributes. You could group them all together in a struct. That's just an idea, but feel free to be creative. Let me know in the comments what other content you would like to see. I read pretty much all the comments I get, so I definitely appreciate the feedback. If you enjoy this content, please hit like, and most of all, hit subscribe and enable notifications. That will help any new videos I create get to you so you know that I've released new videos. A lot of the times people don't even realize I've made videos on content and then they ask me about creating those videos when I've already done it. So definitely subscribe and notifications if you want to see upcoming stuff. Thank you so much and important links will be down in the description. I'll see you in the next video.